Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Culturally Responsive Teaching and Learning. So thank you so much for being here. It looks like we're going to have a great group. My name is Megan Raymond, and I lead membership programs, events, and sponsorship here at WCET. And one of the best parts of my job is that I get to talk with people that are really smart doing fascinating things in higher education. And we have several of those people with us today. As we go through, we'll make sure to add the link to the PowerPoint slides as soon as it's available. And if you have any questions, do enter them into the Q&A and feel free to engage in the chat. But we do ask that you put your questions into the Q&A because if you put them in chat, sometimes they get lost. If you'd like to follow along on social, uh, the hashtag is WCET webcast. This is being recorded and we'll send you a link to the recording any resources that were shared, and the slides early next week. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and welcome today's moderator, a longtime friend of, just, of WCT, Justin Lauder, who's the Associate Vice President for Academic Innovation with Anthology. And we are very grateful to Anthology's support and partnership with this webinar. Take it away, Justin. Great. Thank you very much. And, and good afternoon, all. Um, thank you for joining us on this uh, Thursday um, for uh, this webinar. And we are going to talk today about culturally responsive teaching. Um, and I want to uh, talk about a little bit uh, just to set the stage. But, and then I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves. So in 2020, um, Every Learner Everywhere uh, did a great blog post called Curricula That Account for All Students, um, a look at culturally responsible teaching, uh, responsive teaching in, in higher education. And in that blog, um, we, they attempt to confront and remove equity gaps. I'm talking about the need to view students' cultural knowledge as an asset and then scaffolding that knowledge to the concepts being taught. I also know that culturally responsive teaching values our students' diverse experiences and their backgrounds. And faculty can build a curriculum that resonates um, with their class on a deeper, deeper level by drawing from students' languages, their cultures, their life experiences, um, and doing this in data-informed research-based um, approaches. So today I am joined by three great panelists that will discuss strategies for implementing uh, culturally responsive teaching and learning, as well as some digital learning considerations. So before we jump into our discussion, I'm gonna ask our panelists to go ahead and introduce themselves and we'll start with Erin. Hello, and thank you for having me here today. Erin um, Dentrum, she, her, hers, and I am Senior Education and Training Specialist with Anthology, been there about Two years, I work with assessment for our, our Anthology Academy, um, and that works with all the tools to be sure that our clients are getting their best experience with um, their interaction with us. So prior to joining Anthology, I spent about 25 years on college and university campuses in a variety of roles, uh, mostly institutional effectiveness, assessment, uh, student affairs, and I also served on faculty. Um, and taught graduate and undergraduate courses in research and psychology. Great. Thank you, Erin. Um, now we'll go over to Norma. Thank you, Justin. So my name is Norma Hollebeck, and I'm the Senior Manager for Network Programs and Services with Every Learner Everywhere. I've been with the organization for about three years now. Um, prior to Every Learner, I spent I have spent more than 25 years in higher education. I hate to say how many more, but, um, and of that 25 years, about 15, a little more than 15 years, focused um, on digital learning. Um, I was both a faculty um, as well as a dean for a while and um, did a lot of initiatives developing and designing online biology courses and really helping to promote how we can best leverage emerging technologies to transform teaching and learning and for the advancing of equity in higher education to improve student success. Great. Thank you for joining us, Norma and Shaney. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the middle of your day. Um, this is a 
just an exciting opportunity to be with each of you today. Uh, my name is Shani Suber, and I have the honor of serving on WCT Steering Committee and currently represent two-year institutions. Um, and I always look forward to connecting with like minds, everyone in this space and joining this call. Um, at Dallas College, I'm in the role as Dean of E-Learning Effectiveness and Enhancement, which is for all of our seven campuses. Uh, my career includes roughly 20 years um, of teaching across K-12, as well as in the higher education space, um, include faculty technology coaching, accessibility, sustainability. Uh, however, now I am beginning year 24, which I'm excited about. And my career has actually shifted into this wonderful space where academics meets technology. So all everything online e-learning. So enjoying it. Excellent. So again, to our three panelists, thank you for, for joining. Um, and for the audience, um, we are going to spend really probably the next 30 minutes or so um, with a discussion over um, the ideas behind culturally responsive um, teaching and culturally responsive digital teaching. Um, we'll have some time toward the end of this webinar for an audience Q&A. So I would again uh, remind you, please add your questions into the Q&A feature on Zoom so that our panelists can uh, can read those and then we can answer them toward the end. Um, and then we'll do a, a conclusion. And again, uh, as Megan said at the beginning, this is being recorded um, and also um, you can follow along um, via social. So to jump right in, um, really what I wanna start with is, is the idea behind culturally responsive teaching and learning. So to our panelists, we'll start with Norma. Um, what does culturally responsive teaching and learning um, look like? And, and let's expand on that a little bit and say, why is it also important? So let's first consider culturally responsive learning. What are the prior learning experiences, identities, perspectives, uh, cultural contexts, which the students bring to your course? Um, what approaches can faculty members and instructors use to help those students connect course concepts with prior learning, build collaboration skills, uh, contextualize learning with real world application? To frame culturally responsive teaching and learning, let's consider the perspective of instructors and um, what they have in terms of looking at their students. Uh, we as faculty and as inst institutional leaders need to move away from deficit-based perspectives and deficit thinking and move to a strengths-based perspective, strength-based thinking, or sometimes referred to as asset-based asset approach. Um, <clears throat> an asset-based approach, it views equity in higher education as the end goal. And it recognizes the deep cultural differences between, you know, that the students bring from their home cultures and their prior experiences. It adds value to education as a relational rather than a transactional system. And equity-minded or asset-based approaches seek to make use of the vast stores of cultural capital that students bring from their home cultures in our teaching and learning practices by using these cultural components as building blocks to the curriculum. And educators hold, you know, that, that hold that strength-based perspective as they develop or revise materials can be aware of what the students bring into the classroom as an asset. And for the students to contribute their wealth of knowledge and bring in their community cultural capital, see themselves reflected within the lessons and educators must be aware of those students' cultural identities and create that meaningful learning environment by intentionally designing materials and creating spaces that reflect that wealth of knowledge, um, as well as the cultural capital. Um, so we really need to be very intentional, very meaningful in terms of designing and developing our content, um, shifting from that deficit base to that asset based perspective. The, the ultimate goal of culturally responsive teaching is to help students accelerate their learning by building cognitive learning muscle. And culturally responsive teaching is one of many equity moves that gets at the core of quality teaching. And the power 
of culturally responsive teaching is that it invites and makes room for students culturally based learning styles and experiences in the learning environment as well as the content and the processes. So thank you, Norma. Now, now, Aaron, I'm going to ask you the, the same question, but because of your extensive background in, in assessment, um, institutional effectiveness and things like that, I'm, I want to ask, um, how does assessment come into play uh, with things like culturally responsive teaching and learning? Why is that important? Um, and what would you say is uh, makes up culturally responsive teaching and learning? So this uh, equity-centered assessment is something I became interested in about five years ago. Um, and we had just started a new assessment office at where the university where I was, and we were doing some different things with goals. Um, and that was something that I thought, okay, what is this? What does it look like? Um, so I, I think going back to what Norma said is, Assessment is a critical component of culturally responsive teaching and learning. Um, it helps us inform how effectively edu educational content is being delivered and understood by students from various cultural backgrounds. So if we give kind of a, I guess, a definition of culturally um, sensitive or equity-centered assessment, it's actually the practice of evaluating individuals in a way that does respect and consider cultural beliefs, values, and experiences. So it's not assessment in this approach is more than just measuring knowledge. It's about recognizing and valuing the diverse ways that students understand and engage with that knowledge. So um, it's really a, a major component and aspect of culturally responsive teaching and learning. It, you know, and I think if, if we think about what we know about the assessment cycle, you know, we determine our outcomes, we consider our methods, we analyze the data and we use and share results. But on either side of that assessment cycle, we need to remember the context. Um, where are our students positioned, uh, institutional context, and then um, also uh, blanketing, but surrounding the other side is impact. What is student learning? What is the impact on that? So it, it's a bigger context and picture than just the basic assessment cycle. Um, I think another thing that's it, important is I want to think about some examples of equity-centered assessment and culturally responsive assessment is it captures the whole student. We want to capture that whole student, uh, social, emotional, and cultural competencies, and not just academic knowledge. In some ways, we can do this is learn from Indigenous paradigms and practices Balloons is not the only tool to use when we're looking at learning outcomes. We can use other things like Fink's taxonomy, significant learners. Um, and that's, Fink's defines learning as a change in the learner. Uh, the medicine wheel, that again looks at all different aspects of um, Indigenous American and Native peoples, what's important to them in their learning? Um, what's important in their post-secondary education? So it includes, the medicine wheel includes an emotional component, physical, spiritual, and intellectual. So I think those are some types of things um, that impact the holistic classroom experience. So... I think that's where I would, would start with talking about assessment in that aspect. Excellent. Thank you, Erin. Um, and now, um, uh, Shani, what are your thoughts on ex what is exactly culturally responsive teaching and learning? What does it look like? Um, why is it important? Thank you. Um, one of the pieces, I think, in looking at examples of what this looks like um, is to consider the multi-layered approach. Um, you know, as Norma mentioned, what's the experience? Uh, where do our students start? How do they move through semesters is, is a really broad view, but 
how do we get them essentially to the part of learning? So this is from their first interaction on campus to the classroom. And so one of the things that uh, we'd like to share is just about discourse. You know, where are students' primary discourse? Where are they coming into our institutions um, in terms of what they know, how, you know, think, speak, and act in an academia um, um, atmosphere, right? And so what does that mean? How do they have those experiences? And essentially, how do we uh, help bridge the two? So it values their, where they're coming from, um, what they're coming to the door with, and then also continuing to grow and uh, feel, you know, empowered and supported in our campuses and their learning journey. So I think that that's the part when we meet them and treasure their journey throughout our institution from when they first come to the campus. Uh, so for I think this is kind of a multi-layered approach, starting with um, for us, you know, at Dallas College, we have the College Caring Network. And so, you know, basic needs are first, right? So the Student Care Network actually is kind of the central point um, of contact for Dallas College students, you know, that have any personal, emotional, medical, we're bringing everything in into that space. Having um, food pantries on campus, having um, places to get, you know, clothes for interviews or, you know, support for career services and really looking at um, any devices, loans, support, what do you need coming into the door? Once you kind of get to the place of the, the care network, the second layer, um, one of the things we implement here uh, is Caring Campus. And this, this is actually essentially a framework developed by our Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. And this is essentially to create a supportive class environment and using that regular and substantive engagement in terms of feedback and interaction with their students so that they can be successful. So um, our faculty earn about two hours of professional development credit and also um, as part of their online teaching certifications. And often, you know, we do have kind of what are these, what does this mean, right? What are these areas? So these focus around six particular areas. Um, so setting the tone within the classroom, uh, making sure students are understanding how to communicate regularly with their instructors, but also with their peers, um, promoting student success, ensuring that they can incorporate collaborative learning, facilitating engaging discussions and that grading and feedback. So when we think about what is that calibrator, what is the foundation um, that our, our faculty are participating in, um, the Caring Campus is, is one of those uh, models and framework. So this is um, one piece that we look at, and I can share some more just a little bit um, later around, you know, when we talk about students coming to the campus, their experience within uh, the classrooms, but also what we do uh, for our administrators as well. So I'm going to I'm going to make us go a little bit later right now, because that <laughs> that is that's where I want to go next. Um, the importance of these frameworks. So. Um, I'll put you back on the spot and and say, um, kind of, you've talked about a little bit of the frameworks you've got at Dallas Colleges, mm -hmm. and, and I'd love to hear more about that and the reasoning behind it, um, and maybe some some practical examples that that you have seen where this, I believe you called it a, a caring campus mm -hmm. um, and caring courses, where that is as taking taken Dallas Colleges and and the work you're doing. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, as we, we talk about like that layered approach, because it doesn't stop there, right? I think um, when we look at just this wraparound, not only our students, um, but our employees, our faculty, uh, and also administrators. So, you know, there's a different areas that we've looked at, because again, you know, when we talk about this, essentially kind of being this journey, um, it is as such, you know, it's kind of this, you know, concurrent um, progress, but remembering across different areas. So in terms of administrators, one of the things that we've done and just thinking about, you know, that sense of belonging. And, you know, this was something we implemented um, this year, which is, you know, in order to have that strong sense of belonging on our campuses, 
we need to ensure it also encompasses our administrators who are actively supporting both the students and employees. So the administrators are, you know, approachable. They are supportive, you know, connecting with students, certainly ensuring that employees feel valued and then en enhancing that connection to the campus community and contributing more than just, you know, that positive uh, educational experience for our students. So one additional example from that layer is essentially across the campus, all of the, our academic administrators participated in a professional development um, by AQ, which is fostering, you know, a culture of belonging. And this was, you know, to focus on building a campus culture where everyone, including students, employees can feel seen, heard and valued and very active uh, course. I mean, definitely not something that you can check the boxes and, and move to the next um, component of it. You know, very thoughtful, engaging times to pause, reflect, and even, you know, within all the roles thinking, what am I coming uh, to, you know, the institution with, um, and even in leadership. So with this piece, um, they essentially offer different certifications that contribute to student success, but overall the roles include not just, you know, you think of deans, associate deans, directors, but accessibility, advising, teaching, um, everything that encompasses every role, which is a leader. And I, for me, I feel like that's every role. <laughs> um, so I would say that this is just continuing to connect the overview of perspective and, and understanding not just from where we're coming in every day, but everyone. So this was something that we did um, essentially announcement, you know, across that this is a professional development um, that was going to be supported uh, as part of professional development for academic administrators. So it definitely yielded over a hundred um, administrators completing this 18 hour online course. Um, we did this over the course of the summer and, uh, you know, came back together kind of as a collective on one day with all uh, academic administrators, but then on the second day also layering into each of the seven schools and the administrators across that space. So, you know, I just believe that once we prioritize the well-being and growth of, you know, the entire campus community, then it will certainly foster that inclusive uh, environment where, you know, everyone feels that value and empowered with the institution. Excellent. Um, so kind of continuing with, with that, that same idea. Um, so I'll, I'll go to Norma and, and Norma, I'll ask you, um, you, you've heard some examples here from Dallas colleges on, on the frameworks that, that they, um, are starting to employ and, and some of the development that they're doing. Um, when, when I say to you, you know, what are frameworks of, of culturally responsive pedagogy? Um, why are those things um, something that, that campuses should think about? Um, what, what would you say? It, it goes back to the, the students needing that sense of belonging. If they feel as though they belong on campus, they will be more successful. Um, one of the things that we recently worked with a, a handful of colleges on um, was helping them to build out some of their own frameworks, similar to what Dallas College did. Um, we were working with them to help them so that their students, which are unique to each of those campuses, each campus has its own culture and, and its own style, and, and the students are very unique. Um, even if you're only going 40 miles down the road to another campus, you're going to see some very unique differences. We, we try to work it at a little bit more broad framework with them so that they can be more individualized, but we really do focus on the importance of awareness that invites um, us as instructors and as leaders in, in higher ed to know our own culture and to recognize the cultural archetypes of individualism and collectivism. We really encourage them as part of their frameworks to build in that community of learners and that learning environment, it, it means creating, if you create that sense of, of community within your campus environment, um, that's going to intellectually and socially encourage the students to feel more safe. They, they're going to feel more as though they belong. It offers that space for students to have their own agency as well as their own experiences and their own voices. We encourage the campuses to um, Embrace teaching and learning as a learning partnership. 
which means fostering that um, in a way that you can reimagine that student teacher relationship as a partnership rather than as a, as a hierarchy and as a power grab. Um, and that ensures the students seeing themselves as being capable learners and letting them to be part of that co-construction of, of the knowledge base. Um, and then one of the other things that we encourage is information processes. It, it, it asks us to connect the, the new content to culturally re relevant examples um, using metaphors in the classroom that are from the students' communities, their everyday life, um, to help them augment that information processing. And I think if we take that all into consideration when we're in the classroom and build frameworks based on some of those foundational components, it really helps if you can then tweak it from campus to campus so it really does fit the unique needs of each of those cultures of students um, beyond their own culture, but the culture of the campus as well, make it belonging um, and really make that uh, the pedagogy responsive. Excellent. So, so Erin, I'm I'm going to change the question up a little bit based on something Norma just talked about, and she talked about um, these connections and the metaphors to use in class. Um, when you hear things like that from an assessment standpoint, um, why would a framework around this culturally responsive pedagogy uh, be important when you're thinking about the assessment that a student may have, uh, both curricularly, co-curricularly? Um, wherever that might be on a, on a campus? So I think twofold, and I want to circle back to sense of belonging as well. So when I was thinking about this um, webcast, and one thing Norma said is using examples um, from students' own cultures and backgrounds, I was trying to think of a way to... Um, talk about inclusive language and context, relevant content on an assessment, whether it's a, you know, a rubric or you know, a, a focus group, a work group, whatever it might be. Um, so one thing we have to do with an assessment is ensure that language is inclusive and understandable to everyone, um, regardless of their background, because that helps in leveling the playing field. So, I was trying to think of some examples and I thought, well, this might be, it, it sounds simplistic, but I think it's an easy way for us to envision what we're looking at. And so a lot of times we assume that there's universally understood um, idioms, figures of speech in predominantly white, predominantly white cultures that may not have any cultural or regional significance. So I thought about, well, obviously, um, I'm from the South, um, and I think my, you know, I, the group that I'm talking to today is really not. So I tried to think of some things, some regional sayings to help us process that. Um, so what I came up with, just as regional examples, is one thing that Southerners say that you would not want to say, obviously, you're probably not going to use this in any type of classroom assessment, student learning outcome. But one of the things we say in the South is family. And that, if, that makes no, oh, somebody just popped up, bless your heart. That was my other one. So, <laughs> so fixing to means we're getting ready or planning to do something. Well, it's a colloquialism. It's, you know, it's Southern speech. And that could be really confusing to somebody else. Um, so I saw Bless Your Heart pop up. That's, if you have not heard that one, it's uh, a sympathetic with a twist of, oh my goodness. Mm. It's, not, they got it's not the best yes. one. Yeah, they got something going on over there. Um, so even things like, um, can you imagine just saying somebody spilled the beans? What on earth would that mean? What does that mean? The ball is in your court. Um, so again, those are some simplistic ways to think about our assessments when we want to be culturally, um, when we're creating those assessments. You know, watch out for bias in your instruments. So, so all of those things. And I want to take us back to belonging for a second, if that's okay. 
because I think it does relate back to what uh, Norma and obviously Shady were both saying. So I'm going to back up a little bit and talk about that um, an overarching definition of belonging. It's a developmental process, and it's rooted in a basic human need to be safe, respected, and to fit comfortably in as our authentic selves. So as students navigate welcoming, unwelcoming campus environments and the co-curricular, extracurricular. Um, so they're navigating all of these things. So sense of belonging is often confused with engagement and involvement and, and they're related, but they're not the same. So engagement is what students do. Investment is the amount of time and energy they spend in engaging activities. And then sense of belonging is an outcome of engagement and involvement. And an easy way to think about this is a student feels a sense of belonging when they feel like I matter. I matter to faculty. I matter to a peer group. I matter to, you know, an administrator. So I think all of those connections are um, important. And ultimately, belonging is tied to our social identities. And this means, you know, the nuanced forms of oppression that are experienced within some of our, you know, the systemic challenges on campuses that we need to work through. Um, so I can stop there if you want to go yeah, and I, we so. I was going to say it, it. It's it's great to do a webinar with with educators that have have so much experience in the classroom because I wanted to talk about sense of belonging next, but we have all done such such a great uh, great job in kind of adding that into our our discussion around frameworks. Um, so in looking at the time, I I want to kind of move to where we talk about um, the the digital aspects of culturally responsive teaching. Um, and how some of those things uh, may may come into play. So I'm going to start with Norma this time. Um, and, you know, we are doing this via, via Zoom. Um, this is with the WCT uh, group. So educational technology, it is, it is core to what many of us on this call um, do in our day-to-day -day life. So, so Norma, um, what are some ways that, that our technology, either in the classroom, outside of the classroom, whatever that might be, what are ways that that can foster um, things like the sense of belonging, um, uh, promote uh, cross-cultural empathy, um, foster a sense of collaboration and communication with, with our students? Um, so so what, are those, what are those things that you think about when, when I say, how can technology um, enhance things like culturally responsive teaching and pedagogy? So educational technology drives collaboration, especially in this, this century, um, especially in the classroom. Now that we have experienced some things, even pre-COVID, it was there driving a lot of the collaboration and instilling more than just curriculum um, in the students. So collaborative education is a pedagogical approach that is centered on students interacting and learning together. If we look pre-pandemic, online and distance education laid the foundation for tech-driven collaborative learning and the emergency remote learning that we experienced during the pandemic put a spotlight on it. It was already there. We just didn't notice it as much because of, of everything else that was going on. Um, but even earlier, you know, prior to the pandemic, there were, you know, Google Classroom, you have LMS messaging systems, you have collaborative spaces within your LMS. There's, you know, nowadays a lot of people use Slack or use Teams. Those are collaborative spaces and, and the students are really using them inside the classroom as well as outside the classroom. And, and classes, if you look at a class that, um, takes a blended approach, they can also strike that balance of engaging their faculty members as well as part of that collaboration. And then you've got the student collaboration, you know, using that technology 
there's times that in a blended environment, you can use things like Flip or Padlet or Miro. There's platforms that are geared towards fostering that that peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, where you can do group problem solving and building of those social skills, which is very reflective of what they're going to see in the workplace. And the more we can emulate that in our classrooms, whether our classrooms are blended face-to-face -face or, or fully online, the more we do that, the more they're going to build their not only their sense of belonging because they're now interacting with their own students, but building their own professional skills so that they feel more of that sense of belonging when they get out into the workforce. Um, digital feedback tools, you know, like Google Docs and stuff have been around for a while and that supports the student's autonomy. Um, it, encouraged that, it encourages that meaningful feedback, assuming that the faculty member, you know, does use it as a meaningful way or other students, if you're going to have uh, other students uh, work with each other. Um, and it's been around. We just didn't really notice it until the po until the pandemic put the spotlight on it. I, I do want to shift, though, from that collaborative part to what does educational technology do to for faculty? How can how can this technology help the faculty member? So most importantly, we need to to shift to and, and this goes to what Aaron's talking about. Shift to a data informed instruction within our classrooms, and. Um, that's both online, blended, and and face to face kind of situations. So you know, from a faculty perspective, imagine if you could assess your students and quickly provide them with relevant instruction at the right time, based on their individual needs, based on the collective needs of the class. You know, what would your course look like? What would it sound like? What would your students be doing? Um, how would they demonstrate content mastery? So data-informed instruction and technology really helps to drive this as well. It, it encapsulates a robust set of ongoing practices that focuses on assessing student learning, analyzing the assessment data, and adjusting your instruction in response. So, you know, 10, 12 years ago, it was referred to as just-in-time teaching. It was like, oh, wow, data-informed teaching. We're going to do this just-in-time. We really need to... It sounds like an old topic, but we do. We don't embrace it as much. We were like, oh, I'm going to look at the survey data from this semester and I'm going to make changes next semester. You have a whole different group of students next semester, different cultures, different community of students. So you need to be doing it at that moment in time. Manufacturing has found out that just-in-time manufacturing works beautifully for certain things. Why can't we embrace it in the classroom so that our students do have that cultural connection. They have that individual teaching that's going on. And it's not as much of a burden on the faculty member. If you use the tools within your LMS, if you use other digital tools and, and technology like adaptive courseware, the student is in there working on content and the student responses create reports for the faculty. That faculty member then can use that for those decision-making processes in a very quick turnaround time. Um, the reports can inform the faculty who can choose what instructional strategy. Oh, I need to shift my strategy next week. I need to take a step back. We don't have content mastery. I can't go on to the next thing. And I can tell you there's a lot of chemists out there and a lot of calc and pre-calc folks that are going to say, yeah, because if I go on to the next step without getting that content mastery of the other things, then the students are just going to continue to get lost exponentially. Um so using those tools from a faculty member's perspective, embracing the tools, it will actually make your life as a faculty member easier, and it helps the students as well. So why can't we do more of that, um, embracing that technology to help? I mean, our, our goal is to help academic leaders and instructional um, institutional researchers to develop those skills, support the faculty member so they can then support the student. So. Um... You made some some great points there, Norma, and and I want to to think about technology uh, now, both um, uh, in the classroom, outside the classroom, and across uh, a, a diverse campus environment. So I, I want to look at at Dallas colleges and and Shawnee and and the the ecosystem that that you have. You are supporting online students. Uh, you said you have seven different campuses, um, and and being uh, 
I'll say just down the road from Dallas, um, although I guess that's relative in, in Texas, uh, knowing a little bit about Dallas colleges, how are, are you leveraging this technology to foster uh, empathy around students, foster this sense of belonging and collaboration? Um, what do you see uh, on your campus? Um, first of all, everyone knows I love this topic. Um, <laughs> so I would say, um, you know, the digital ecosystem, if I could have that on a shirt, um, I probably would. And it's just because we uh, traditionally think about the learning management system as this, you know, one space, you know, for courses and instruction and also, you know, not necessarily just the resources, but um, that's just where the students go to access and 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 learn, right? And and I love this topic because um, you know the the progress here of our learning management system kind of mirrored my career. So I had the the joy of um, and the experience of just transitioning. We just transitioned to a new e campus about four weeks ago. So part of that is around this topic. And it's because we're looking at not only this is a place where you get your materials, but this is also where we're transitioning this space um, across all of the campuses, as you mentioned. So this is not just for students. You know, this is this will be for our employees, um, areas, you know, our student success, workforce, credit, non-credit to create this, you know, calibrated area of information and resources. So this serves as, you know, not only a benefit for our employees, but most importantly, our students, because then now the students have the opportunity to download or access their course materials offline, because we do certainly want to address limited or no access to the internet. So all of these pieces come together. Um, we've certainly layered in and incorporated those key dates. You know, what if students, you know, uh, miss an opportunity to connect with tutoring or with, you um, you know, their, their academic advisor, which we call our success coaches here, where each student has their own success coach. And so this actually helps not only our students, but our, also our, our faculty understand these are those key dates, drop dates, or, you know, progress reporting, or all these different pieces, because life is moving at lightning speed. So I would say that the navigation of, you know, this support throughout the semester is really just kind of that real-time support. How do I post, you know, things within um, my course? How does a new uh, adjunct or, or faculty member um, know how to build things within the LMS so that it doesn't, you know, slow down the, the process of engaging with students. So we've incorporated virtual assistant so the students, you know, and, and instructors can find those uh, real-time uh, answers, you know, to progress in their semester. And so these are just different things that we look at and why this is important is because of calibration, right? So if we're unaware of what's relevant to our students and various populations, and we're in Dallas, obviously, um, very diverse. We are a primarily Hispanic serving institution, but also our students reflect that, obviously, of our population in Dallas. And so I think that if you're unaware of what the students' needs are, how we can connect the students, at least let's provide an environment where um, you can you can look at what the students are looking at. You can see where they can get the resources that they need. So again, we not only use um, the LMS for students, but all of our employees have an account. And we're looking at the same piece and we work with all of our areas because we're updating, you know, constantly, but you also don't want it to be inundated with all these links. You want it to be um, certainly purposeful. So, you know, those are some of the things that we see because Supporting students' questions and connectivity to belonging, student clubs, organizations, scholarships, badging, making sure they understand how they're developing their successes and seeing that progress is key. And so those are all the pieces, you know, that we're bringing together in terms of the digital ecosystem. So I, I have a question that I, I want to get to, um, but I want to wait um, and, and go to a couple of the, the Q&A. Uh, questions from our um, our uh, attendees here, um, and I want to start with with one. And and um, Aaron, I'll I'll start with you for for the answer here. But here's the question: Often, when we hear about culturally responsive teaching, there is a lack of inclusion of people with disabilities. 
how are the views, voices, and values um, included, views, voices, and values of, of those with disabilities included in these type of practices? So Aaron, I'll start with you um, to, to get an idea around this and, and assessment practices and how you can in, be inclusive uh, of all of those voices. So I think um, there are many ways to accomplish that and, and we should be further along with that than we are, you know, thinking about accessibility. Um, so I've been doing, I mean, I've been doing surveys on campuses <laughs> since we were like paper and literal number two pencils. We had the little scantron sheets. So when I would set up um, like we would do the entire freshman class, we would do a large standardized survey and we would get everybody to go to a particular room or if I was doing a focus group, I'd pick a room that was open on campus. And it did not occur to me until many years later, what if a student could not get to that room to participate in this focus group? They are being marginalized not only because there's lack of accessibility, but now they're marginalized because their voice isn't being heard within student populations. Um, so I, I think even thinking about things like that, are your, um, is your technology accessible? Are you using, you know, all, captioning? So all of those different pieces of it um, can impact a student's success and again impact their sense of belonging and and if they're not feeling that they're not going to be successful so so norma i'll go to you same question um we we talked a lot about culturally responsive teaching um and and students voices um what would you say when when you add in or, or what we should do to make sure we include those students with disabilities I, I have to wholeheartedly agree with Aaron that we're not as far along as we should be. Um, we've got to go beyond just acknowledging that they're there. We need to add respect because I think that's something that we have missed and that we continue to miss is, is respecting them as humans, respecting them as students. Um, we, we tend to use, and it goes back to that deficit language. It's like, you have a disability. Well, just because you're in a wheelchair doesn't mean that you're not capable of doing something. You just do it differently. Um, just because you um, are more neurodiverse in some way doesn't mean that you don't belong on this campus or that we're not going to respect you. And, and I think that's where we really have the challenges. We've got to understand there's cultural differences out there and it's not just in terms of an ethnic or race culture. Students that have that neurodiversity or have physical challenges, um, we don't we don't see them as part of that culture. We don't see it as a culture. And I know that it, you know if you go to there's schools for the blind and things like that, you'll find that that culture is embraced on their campuses, and we don't tend to embrace it on our public campuses. And that's something that we just we need to work to get beyond and work on that part of that respect and not see them at, see the difference as a deficit. We need to see that difference as an asset and figure out how we can bring that asset into, um, into that classroom or into the campus. So, so Shani, I'm gonna give you a, a different uh, question uh, from, from our chat. Um, and, and one of our attendees asked, um, because you spent a lot of time talking about sense of belonging and, and uh, those kind of support services we provide students. Uh, so one of our, our, our uh, attendees asks, ask, um, can you give an example of what this sense of a belonging affords our students? And can students be successful without this sense of belonging? I was on mute. That's a great question. Um, wow, sense of belonging. I mean, honestly, this takes me back to my own, just a personal experience uh, being a student in, in a couple different campuses and uh, just remembering 
um, starting at campuses and, and trying to find that that compass, you know, quite frankly, sometimes finding someone that you can see what certain things uh, are possible or, or look like or understanding. And I think that um, because of, you know, some of the pieces that I shared about discourse, um, that was probably, you know, a piece that I was really excited to bring once I became an instructor into uh, my classes, because I understood um, when students came within the classroom, that was the first piece, you know, is this person uh, certainly going to understand, you know, all the things, you know, maybe that that I've walked through and how I'm still walking through and, and certainly trying to navigate whether you have support systems or not, whether you know someone who has, you know, gone to college or completed college or not. So how do you really ensure um, that they have that space to do that? And so with the question of, of, of can they fill that without, you know, um, I guess certain parameters, I think this is where when we're talking about bringing this into the classroom is so key. You know, I had the opportunity of doing, um, you know, both developmental courses as well as, you know, um, uh, beginner courses, uh, freshman level and you do see that difference in that frustration sometimes. I don't want to be in this class. I don't want to be in a particular class to get to the class I'm trying to get to. Um, and there's a lot of emotion around that. And as an instructor, how do you connect with those students understanding that that's a frustrating place to be in, but also how to um, calibrate embracing there's some growth areas there um, so that you are and will continue to be successful in your course. So that's where I layered in, you know, um, certain literature pieces around similar um, uh, experiences. And that's where I brought in also, as I mentioned, the primary and secondary discourse. And that was up front in which I learned a lot about my students. And they shared a lot about, um, you know, their walk. And then that set the tone also for appreciating and supporting that space and moving forward. So I think that when we talk about how do you um, be successful, whether you have the sense of belonging or not, again, that's where this understanding of discourse comes in. And also how do I um, also take initiative to connect and plug in? So yes, I can come to school, I can leave, and sometimes that's the only option. I've been there because you're working full time. Um, but also outside of that space, how do you continue to be encouraged and supported and embrace the institution which you're in, uh, attending? So I think that, you know, those assignments, conversations, um, ensuring by the end of the semester, hopefully you would have had an opportunity to meet with each of your students, you know, and I would have a schedule uh, where I knew by the end of semester would have definitely connected with each of those students. And that's where that space comes in, sharing your own personal journey. Um, and so I think that those are the pieces that help our students progress. And I do on accessibility, I want to share, um, and I, I'll be happy to, to share it in the chat, or, or you can uh, Google the Dallas College Accessibility Checklist, because we did um, college-wide training and still continue to do college-wide training on accessibility. And we have some great examples of 10 um, standard things that we ensure within our classes and our courses are, are accessible um, with our instruction. Excellent. So... Um, we are we are coming up on time, and I and I know Megan needs a, a few minutes at the end to to do some wrap up. So, um, I I want to uh, I have one more question for for our panelists, and I think for our audience um, and attendees today, what what you have heard throughout the last forty five minutes or so is that culturally responsive teaching um, is a journey. It is not a destination, um, and it is something that campuses have to approach. Um, um, in, in various ways, in different ways. And so that's what I wanna, wanna ask our three panelists. And, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say in a minute or so, I'm gonna give each of you a minute to, to answer this question. Um, what advice would you give to our attendees today on how they can start the conversation around culturally responsive teaching and learning on their campus? So I'll start with with Aaron, and and like I said, I'm giving you a minute, so I'll, I'll cut you off. I want to want to see if you can <laughs> you can give us the the Reader's Digest version. Okay, are you going to play me out with some music? Okay, so I could talk about this all day long too, 
one place to get started is to learn. Learn what's in the field. Um, grow, figure out what you can do. Bring along colleagues. Um, and I think the other thing I would say, just in summary, we are used to our instant our student our institutions being um, expecting college ready students. We need to flip that, and we need to be institutions that are ready for our students. It's not the college's responsibility. So the institution needs to start taking some responsibility and flip that script to, to help all of our students succeed and to feel like they belong. Okay, you did great. So now I'll go to, to Aaron. Same question. I'm sorry, Norma. Um, okay, I can do this. Um, the brain physically grows through challenges by being stretched and expanded in its ability to do more complex thinking and learning. That holds true for faculty as well as students. So we must be intentional in creating culturally responsive environments to maximize the intellectual opportunities for students and in order for them to thrive. We must acknowledge that every semester is a different community of students and thus a new teaching and learning journey for both the students as well as the faculty member. And as a first step to operationalizing culturally responsive teaching, you need to understand how and where culture displays show up at different levels in your classroom. Excellent. You did great too. So, so let me take us home. What would you say a campus needs to do to start this journey? Thank you. First, I have to say I'm from Louisiana. So a minute is, is I'm working on that. <laughs> okay. Um, what I would say is that this journey is layered, as I mentioned before, with awareness, processing, and understanding and planning. Talk to your students hard to support students if we don't know what they think and feel and need. Um, one example quickly was just how we work with uh, disability services and asked for some students who wanted to share their journey. We brought teachers together that, you know, are certainly doing accommodations as well. And they shared that space of what that's like for both of them and set some common goals. You can do that with a variety of different uh, student populations. What is the temperature of your campus? Get feedback from your students, from your employees, and what student employee needs are in connecting to the campus, both in person and online. How do we develop, measure, and progress? So just ensure all voices are coming together as a collective for the overview and growth of each area with the goal of connectivity and belonging. Talk to your students. That, that is a great uh, thing to end on. So I want to say thank you to our three great panelists uh, for their insights and their, their ideas, uh, their experiences, uh, and what, what they have learned as they talked about culturally responsive uh, teaching. I also want to say thank you to Megan, the WCET staff, and WCET for, for hosting this webinar. Um, I think we have had a, a great conversation um, and um, really appreciate everybody attending today. Um, Megan, I will turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Justin. This was a wonderful conversation. I appreciate everyone's participation. The, the chat and the questions were fantastic, so thank you for chiming in. Do Join us on our website to learn more about the benefits of being part of the WCET community. And I quickly want to acknowledge our WCET sponsors that underwrite much of our programs and events here at WCET. We couldn't do what we do for the membership and the community without them, especially thank you to Anthology for being a partner in this webinar. We also have several supporting members that invest in WCET membership at a higher level, and we are grateful for them. And thank you for attending. So stay tuned to your inboxes. As soon as Kim gets back from vacation, she'll get this all turned around and back to you. So we'll see you on another WCET event soon. Take care, everybody.